Welcome to the American Security Council Protecting Our Freedoms podcast. The mission of the American Security Council is to educate and engage American citizens on national security matters, economic security matters, and the need for moral leadership in the United States of America. Please enjoy the podcast. Welcome, I am your host, Joy Vonterbeck, bringing you the stories on protecting your freedoms. Today we'll be discussing the debacle in Afghanistan through a 50-year lens. Please consider a one-time donation or membership to the American Security Council Foundation. You can go to www.ascf.us. We take PayPal, major credit cards, and even cryptocurrency. With your donation or membership, of $25 or more, you will receive a free copy of Mark Levin's book titled American Marxism. I am honored to have Colonel, sorry, Colonel Bill Prince with me today to discuss the current debacle in Afghanistan and walk us through the 50-year lens. We will also discuss U.S. foreign policy and finally, where we go from here. Colonel Bill Prince retired received his commission in the infantry from the United States Military Academy at West Point, New York. He served in Vietnam with both Ranger and Special Forces Unit. In 1978, he resigned his regular Army commission to accept a position with the Central Intelligence Agency. He served as an operations officer in the Middle East, Africa, and Central America. He retired from the CIA in 1993 Bill is a recipient of one of the CIA's highest awards for valor. For extraordinary hero heroism in the face of hostile armed opposition. Since his retirement from the CIA, he has continued to serve overseas, engaged, engaged in contract work for various U.S. government agencies. His experience in hostile areas include El Salvador, Somalia, Haiti, Bosnia, Afghanistan, Colombia, Pakistan, and Iraq. He retired from the Army Reserve in 2001 with 31 years combined active and reserve service. In 2008, he was recalled to active duty and assigned to the U.S. Special Operations Command at MacDill Air Force Base, Tampa, Florida. He subsequent, subsequently used the GI Bill to pursue a master's degree at Harvard University with a focus in international relations. He received the Dean's Award for Academic Achievement with a cumulative GPA of 3.85. His master's thesis explored Iranian capabilities to conduct terrorist actions in the Western Hemisphere. So I am honored to welcome Colonel Prince with us today. Joy, most of that is true, by the way, <laughs> of what you just read. Most of it's true, no, actually. <laughs> it's a very quick story, and since my lovely wife of 41 years is in the studio with us, I was giving a presentation to a group of junior ROTC cadets, and one young man raised his hand and said, well, Colonel Prince, what's the most dangerous thing you've ever done? And I said, oh, that's easy, marry my wife. And I am sure that that young man thought I was kidding, but <laughs> <laughs> I was certainly not. Now, it is a real pleasure to be here. Um, I hope that I can share with you some of the things that, um, that I've seen and some of the conclusions that I've come to uh, being involved in a number of different hostile situations over the past 50 years. So it's a real pleasure to be here with you all, and let's dive in. Well, I want to thank you, first of all, for your service in multiple arenas. And thank you for your membership with the American Security Council Foundation. Yes, indeed. And this I is hope you enjoy your American Marxism book. <laughs> I did. Actually, I, I've already started reading it. Excellent. Well, let's dive in. My first question to you is, ha having served in a number of hostile areas and, and several times in Afghanistan, what are your thoughts on what has happened? Uh, I'm heart sick. We're going to be covering uh, a great deal of ground uh, this afternoon. And um, 
I'm probably, uh, I'm sure I'm going to say some very controversial uh, things. Um, when you get to be 74 years old, maybe you can be excused for doing that. But I am going to look back um, through a 50-year lens on this debacle in Afghanistan and try to connect uh, some dots. Now, I fully expect a lot of people to disagree um, with uh, some of the things that I'm going to say. Um, and, uh, and some people who have uh, a great deal more experience um, than I do in Afghanistan. I deployed 11 times between Iraq and Afghanistan, uh, but most of that was um, uh, focused on Afghanistan. But um, I know there are a lot of people out there that have a, a lot more time than I do, and uh, so I think we can respectfully disagree. But um, as I look back over 50 years, I want to share with you some personal conclusions. Um, I feel that we face a, uh, an even more dangerous situation now uh, than we did before this debacle. And uh, so I want to share with you some of the conclusions and some of the reasons why this is, in my view, such a serious situation. Thank you. And uh, what, do you think what do you think about President Biden blaming President Trump for saddling him with this flawed peace deal <coughs> and the Afghan soldiers for refusing to fight for their country? <sighs> First of all, and it's a trite phrase, but uh, hindsight is always 2020, I, and I recognize that. Um, I was in intelligence for a long time, and predictive intelligence is very difficult. But um, I am just uh, angry that President Biden has tried to shift the blame. Um, I, I can make a strong case for the peace deal that the Trump administration uh, thought that they had with the Taliban. It was, in fact, a, a flawed deal. Uh, I thought it was a, a mistake at the time, um, especially when the Trump administration pressured the Afghan government to release, and I think it was about 5,000 Taliban prisoners that they had. That's a lot of folks. Um, but my main point is that, and I think it was 17, it was over a dozen executive orders that President Biden uh, rescinded his first day in office. If he really had a problem with this peace deal that the Trump administration had, uh, had uh, uh, agreed upon with the Taliban, if he really had a problem with that, he should have said, this is a bad deal, we're not going to do that, we're out of it. So I think, I firmly believe that this administration needs to own this debacle. Um, also, it's very concerning for me because I was in the Army for quite a while, but there's a Washington Post article out that said that, the, that President Biden overruled the advice of his CENTCOM commander, uh, Frank McKenzie, I believe is his name, General Frank McKenzie. Cent Central Command has, the, they have responsibility for most of the Middle East. Overruled his um, uh, General Scott Miller, who was the last commander of all the NATO forces in Afghanistan. And, and I worked with Scott decades and decades ago. I always found him to be a very capable, competent officer, and also overruled the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, uh, General uh, Mark Miley. Um, if, in fact, this is true, that these three officers recommended to the president that it's a bad idea to pull all of our troops out of there, if that's true, then those three officers, it's easy for me to say, but those three officers should resign in protest. Um, now, again, I'm referring to a Washington Post article, but those three officers reportedly were recommending that we leave a residual force in Afghanistan, and I think that, my considered opinion, that was the right advice to give 
to the president. We need to remember that the enemy has a vote. Things change very quickly. The Biden administration has been in power now for eight months. And uh, if the situation on the ground uh, was changing, then uh, the Biden administration should have been in a position to react quickly to that. And finally, and I feel very strongly about this, and I'll probably take some, some heat for saying this, but I believe it is absolutely criminal for uh, any military commander, in this case our commander-in-chief, to tell our enemies when we're going to pull out, or even if we are going to pull out. I think that is absolutely criminal. And um, uh, I've said that in other venues. I've had friends of mine who definitely disagreed with that. But the example that I like to use is if Franklin Roosevelt, in the fall of 1944, had said, you know what, we're going to bring the boys home by Christmas. We're going to be out of the European theater of operations before Christmas, and uh, we've, we're declaring victory and we're going home. I can guarantee you that the Ardennes offensive, the Battle of the Bulge, would have turned out very differently had we telegraphed a decision that we were going to pull our troops out. Mm, good points. Um, do you believe our attempts at nation-building in Afghanistan are misguided? Uh, <laughs> this, is a, this is a hot button topic and I'm probably going to alienate a few people on my considered opinion that uh, I think nation-building, our nation-building attempts in Afghanistan, I think, uh, I think uh, those attempts were a mistake and frankly I think trying to nation build in a whole bunch of other places around the world. I think those um, are mistakes. And I base that on, going back about 50 years, but I base that uh, on a couple of, I think, key considerations. First of all, uh, cultural. I don't think we understand different cultures very well. And, I, and I've worked Asia as a young infantry second lieutenant, or maybe I was a first lieutenant at the time. But I've worked Asia, I've worked Africa, I've worked Latin America, I've worked the Middle East. The, the, the Muslim Arab culture in the Middle East was far and away the most difficult for me to, to understand and, uh, and to interact uh, in. Uh, and, and I don't think we understand different cultures very well. I think we always assume that these different cultures think the same way we do, and they definitely do not. Um, I remember when uh, President Barack Obama gave his inaugural address, and he was talking about Iran, and remember I did my Harvard thesis on Iran, but in his inaugural, inaugural address he said, um, we will extend a hand if you, the Iranians, are willing to unclench your fists. Well, I don't think that's worked out real well. Next, geography. I don't think we have a very good handle uh, on geography. Um, I don't think we do, um, do it very well in our educational system. And I think we have a tendency to look at a map, for example, Afghanistan, and we see on a map, we see, oh, Afghanistan, and we see nice lines indicating borders, and that makes sense to us. Well, I can tell you, uh, because I worked the, the Pak-Afghan border a lot, that border made absolutely no difference, impacted not a bit to those Pashtun tribesmen. They would go back and forth uh, over that border without even thinking about it. And we also think that because a nation, there's a, the name of a country on a map, that there must be some sense of national identity or national loyalty in a lot of places around the world that just doesn't exist. And if Afghanistan, I would bet that there is not one person in a thousand in Afghanistan, if you said, well, are, are you an, an Afghan? 
well, no, no, I'm a Pashtun or I'm a Wazir or I'm a Masood or whatever tribe they're from. That would be their first loyalty. Patience is another, I think, key reason why we don't do nation building very well. As a culture, I don't think we, we display good patience. We have a tendency in our culture, uh, a, a uh, kind of a, a, a willingness, uh, an eagerness to, um, to be pragmatist. It's kind of uh, let's get her done and pop the top on a cold beer. Uh, that does not work in nation building. I, I, and so I don't think we have, culturally, I don't think we have the patience uh, tools, I think we go into nation building far too often with lots of money and lots of technology. I think too often the money breeds corruption and contempt. I think a lot of it is wasted. Um, and the technology, frequently we try to employ technology and the host nation is simply not capable of absorbing the technology, using the technology. They don't have the resource even to support that technology. And then finally, and again, I'm probably on thin ice here, but I think it's a mistake to expect our military to bear the, do the heavy lifting for nation building. That should not be their job. Their job, our military's job, should be to lethally and effectively fight wars, not win hearts and minds. Yes, th these are very good points. I could definitely say culturally and geography-wise. And then you just brought that last point, um, our military should be going in to fight. And I can attest to that as my husband served in Iraq two tours. And they are taught to go in and fight, not to nation build, not to win the hearts and minds of people. Exactly, right, exactly right. Uh, what do you think... Um, about committing troops into trouble spots? I feel that we, over the last few decades, actually, we've been uh, far too comfortable uh, on inserting troops into situations um, where uh, we probably shouldn't have gone. I spent quite a bit of time in Somalia. And uh, even when we go in to, with the best of intentions, uh, those situations can turn out um, to be tremendous problems. And I feel strongly that if we're going to commit troops, we go in hard and fast and we hurt the bad actors. We hurt them as much as we possibly can and then we leave. And I suspect that some of the listeners to this podcast are going, oh, that's just awful. Well, I think it's a mistake to employ our line units, our big battalions, in, I think, they're trained to go in and break things and hurt people. If we're going to go into a situation where we think in our national interest we need to be in there for the long haul, then we need to expect to be in there in the long haul. I think of, we've had troops in Germany for uh, 75 years. We've had troops in South Korea for, for 70 years. Now that's the long haul. I'm going to exhibit a bias here, but I believe that more is not necessarily better in lots of places around the world. Now, as I said, I'm exhibiting a bias. Uh, I spent a lot of time in special operations. I'm a real believer in a small footprint um, you go in with highly qualified trainers and advisors, um, culturally qualified, ideally language qualified, ideally volunteers. You've got these small teams and you work with the host nation forces. You provide them with some logistics. I'm talking about providing the host nation with logistics, some logistics, some air support, uh, maybe some intel support, but it has to be the host nation that does the fighting. It has to be their war. Um, and uh, I think, of course, you, you know, I first deployed to Vietnam as a, as a brand new lieutenant, and I feel that we made a terrible mistake in Vietnam, and, and, and again, I'm open for criticism on this, but I feel that we, we look to the South Vietnamese Army 
um, the Arvins, uh, and we basically put the bulk of their military forces uh, into pacification operations, winning hearts and minds, and, and to a s- certain extent, we said, step aside, we're going to win this war for you. Now, to the Vietnam veterans out there, uh, I recognize that the Arvins had some great units. The Arvin Airborne Division, um, the South Vietnamese Marines, Arvin Ranger battalions were excellent. And, uh, and some of their infantry divisions were good. But I felt that we did them a great disservice when it became um, uh, politically impossible for us to continue our combat operations in Vietnam then we essentially said, oh, we're out of here, goodbye and good luck. And then the Democrats in Congress decided to cut funding to, uh, to the South Vietnamese military, and we paid a terrible price for that, and uh, we're paying a terrible price now, 50 years later, in the debacle in, in Kabul. Yes, um, Colonel... If we could go back there to what you said, um, if we either either we go in hard and fast and leave, or we stay for the long haul, mm-hmm. in your opinion, should we have gone in hard and fast and left in Afghanistan? Uh, I believe we should have. Um, uh, I, I think that, uh, and and I would um, I would say the same thing about Iraq. Um, uh, you go in with shock and awe and uh, with the understanding that you tell the bad actors that uh, we're going to put the hurt on you, and then you leave. Um, I think it's a a terrible mistake for us to stay around, and and I spent a fair amount of time in Iraq and saw the aftermath of that. Um, So, uh, again, I think we ought to go in hard, fast. We hit them hard, fast, as hard and fast as we can, and then, and then we leave. Thank you. Um, but what about an overseas threat to our national security? Uh, I've developed <laughs> what I call the Muammar Gaddafi strategy. And that is, <clears throat> if we have a bad actor or bad actors, um, an individual or a group that um, is uh, a threat to our national security, and you could argue that Muammar Gaddafi was, then we fly two cruise missiles into Gaddafi's bathroom window and we say to Gaddafi, don't mess with us or we'll be back and the next time we'll get you. I know there are listeners saying, oh, that is just way oversimplified. Well, it got Gaddafi's attention after that, Gaddafi was sweetness and light. So in my considered opinion, Ronald Reagan did exactly the right thing by doing that. Um, and also, I completely reject what I've heard referred to as the Colin Powell Doctrine. I've also heard it referred to as the uh, Pottery Barn Rule. If you break it, then you own it. Or if you break it, you've got to build it, rebuild it. You've got to take care of it. You've got to fix it, whatever. I'm not exactly sure that Colin Powell ever really said that. But in my view, we should completely reject that. You go in, you hit hard, and you fast, and you leave, and you say, sorry about that, and you tell those bad actors, don't mess with us. I have heard that uh, comment before, so thank you for your clarification and your opinion on that. Uh, I, I feel, this sounds harsh, but I feel that in international relations, and that was my focus at Harvard was international relations, it is very nice to be liked around the world. That's nice. We, we, we're Americans. We like people to like us. We also should want people to respect us. And if we have to pick one between being liked and being respected, we need to opt for the second one. Well, Colonel, it sounds like you might be recommending an isolationist <laughs> strategy. And at age 74, and being perhaps a little crankier than I used to, my wife can comment on that, 
But uh, in actual fact, I am becoming something of an isolationist. I've lost too many friends. Uh, Over the years, I've sent young men into harm's way who did not come back. And, um, And that's hard. And you have to ask yourself, okay, what have we accomplished? What did we accomplish? With, with our sacrifice. Um, I believe we cannot be the world's policemen. We simply cannot do it. Um, and I think it's a mistake. I think we need to look at situations and we need to decide, is this situation a threat to our national security? If it is, then perhaps we need to commit the resources to try to combat that. I would submit, for example, our open southern border is a threat to our national security. We have hundreds of thousands of people coming in. We have no idea who these people are. I would submit that is an existential threat to our national security. Um, But a quick, very quick story about that. I was in Pakistan uh, working with a a Pakistani uh, lieutenant colonel counterpart, and I was beating up on him because I was telling him, not, I, that's not literally beating up on him, figuratively beating up on him. And I said, you know, you got to get control of this sector of the border. The Taliban, Al Qaeda are running from um, Afghanistan into Pakistan. You got to get control of your border. And this PAC lieutenant colonel looked at me and he said, oh yeah, get control of our border, right? Yeah, kind of the way you've got control of your southern border, your border with Mexico. And I went, ooh, ouch. That hurts. You know, he was exactly right. There's a point. We have a tendency to run around the world telling other countries how to run their affairs when, in my considered opinion, we ought to be focusing at home. We have riots and shootings and lootings in our city. I consider that to be an existential threat to our national security, the security of our citizens. We need to be focused on that rather than running around the world telling other countries how they ought to be handling their own affairs. Yes, we have talked um, on this podcast about the same situation here with the rioting and looting. It's it's a, a terrible threat. We need to be focused on problems right here at home and making hard decisions about problems right here at home. I mean, as I mentioned a moment ago, I spent quite a bit of time in Somalia. My, I dragged my lovely wife there for two years when it was still sort of a country, and then I deployed back on D plus one with the Joint Task Force into anarchy. And we went in there with the best of intentions. There were starving babies, and we went in there to try to get food out into the interior of the country stop the warlords from stealing all the food. We just wanted to help those poor people. And yet, the next thing we know, we've got two Black Hawk helicopters and hundreds of Somalis doing their best to try and kill us. So speaking about Somalia and other hot spots in the, in the globe, um, finally, what do you see for the future? <laughs> oh, boy. Uh, I was an intelligence officer for quite a while, and doing predictive intelligence is very difficult, uh, dangerous. But uh, there are a couple of things that occur to me after watching this situation unfold in, in Afghanistan. First and foremost, we need to rebuild our military Uh, and we need to imbue them with a a warrior ethos. Um, We need to get back to having a military that is focused on being, and I think it was the Alabama football coach Bear Bryan wanted his football players to be mobile, hostile, or something. I can't remember the third one. Mobile and hostile and... and, uh, But anyway, we need to have a lethal military force, um, and that should be our focus as we rebuild from this. Um, I came back from Vietnam to a badly damaged army. Uh, We had drug problems and race problems. Uh, I think we need to rebuild our military. And I'm going to, as I've said maybe too many times, that... 
in blaming this current administration for this debacle. I think we need, as a society, as a country, we need to do our best to block this administration's um, efforts to infect our military with their social justice and progressive ideologies. Um, I hope, Joy, if I get asked back again, uh, and I'm not sure I will after making so many controversial statements, but uh, I hope to do um, another podcast for our listeners on critical race theory. Uh, I believe that is a a devastating impact on our military, on troop morale and unit cohesion. We need to do our best to block the Biden Biden administration's efforts to uh, create a kinder, gentler military. I think we need to understand that people overseas, over the near and intermediate term, are going to have serious reservations about trusting us. And again, I spent a lot of time as an intelligence officer. I think it's going to be really difficult for us to expect people around the world to trust us and provide us with valuable intelligence, valuable information. They're going to say, ooh, I don't know. I don't think you guys have a lot of resolve here, and I'm not sure that you have our backs. So I think we need to expect that. Um, I believe that a lot of people around the world, and especially our enemies, are looking at the Biden administration as weak and incompetent. I think that's how our enemies look at this administration right now. Weak and incompetent. Um, And I think that they may very well use this um, to uh, press us. Uh, They think they may have uh, psychological advantage now. And so, and again, I did my Harvard thesis on Iran, and I would uh, expect the Iranians to push very hard to get nuclear weapons. I fear that one day One morning, we will wake up and the Iranians will say, oh, surprise, uh, we have nuclear weapons after all. Uh, I think we can expect the Chinese to uh, push uh, their designs on Taiwan. I think we can expect the North Koreans to rattle sabers. But here's the thing that I'm most concerned about, and that is the Middle East. And again, I was in and out of there for over 30 years. I worked operationally in 11 or 13 countries. I added them up the other day. Um, This will embolden radical Islamists in the Middle East, this victory of theirs in in Afghanistan. And and they've made no secret of it. Uh, Several of the senior uh, Taliban leaders said, this is not just about Afghanistan, this is about Islam and a victory for Islam. And... um, Uh, Allah Akbar, God is greater, we're going to um, uh, push Islam into the rest of the world. So we need to be very, very cautious about what's going to happen in the Middle East and the um, this shot in the arm for radical Islamists who think that uh, they can do to us again what they've done to us in Afghanistan. And then finally, uh, we need to understand that our enemies watch us very, very closely. Um, I don't think it's any coincidence that um, the Iranian leadership decided to release our embassy hostages. I had two colleagues that were hostages for 444 days when the Iranians took over our embassy there. I don't think it is any coincidence that the Iranian leadership decided to release those hostages on the day that Ronald Reagan became president. I feel strongly they thought they could push Jimmy Carter around, but they didn't want to try that with Ronald Reagan. So that's looking in my crystal ball for the future, and I hope I'm wrong on a lot of a bunch of those issues. Colonel Prince, if I could ask some questions. Yes, please. 
there was an article just recently today or yesterday I read that uh, in what you're saying, our enemy is looking at us, especially um, Islamic jihadists in different parts of the world, other than even just the Middle East, uh, Somalia you mentioned, uh -huh. and they were talking about Al-Shabaab in Somalia. Yes, Could, uh, indeed. be a resurgence there? Do you believe there'll be a resurgence in other ISIS or Islamic groups? I, 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 I fully expect there to be a resurgence. Um, I was astounded uh, when the Trump administration was able to get countries in the Middle East to um, to establish diplomatic relations with Israel. I, I, I never in my wildest dreams thought that that would happen. Um, I um, anticipate that um, some of those countries may uh, renege on that. Um, I think in places like Somalia, uh, places like Yemen, um, uh, even the Philippines, uh, and again, I did my Harvard thesis on Iranian uh, capabilities to conduct uh, covert or terrorist operations in the Western Hemisphere, we could very well see the Iranians causing trouble in, uh, in Latin America. Um, and so uh, I think many places around the world, I think the, the Biden administration saying, okay, well, we've got whatever we had, I think it was 2,500 troops left in Afghanistan. I suspect that we will find ourselves having to commit more troops in a lot more places around the world because of what we let happen in Afghanistan. Thank you for that. And a final comment, maybe, or a question, but um, in regards to Iran um, causing problems in Latin America, could you clarify also their proxies like Hezbollah? Would you consider that yes. a big problem in Latin America? Exactly. Well put. Um, the, the Iranians, at least the leadership, uh, they are not our friends. And um, that so-called nuclear deal that the, Biden, uh, the uh, Obama administration had, um, uh, I think it was a terribly flawed deal. I think that Donald Trump was exactly right to get out of that. Um, and I think any ideas that the Biden administration wants to re-engage in that nuclear deal, I think, is, is a terrible mistake. Um, when you have um, big crowds after Friday uh, services in the mosque, big crowds screaming, death to America, it, maybe we should pay attention to that, okay? Maybe they really do want to do us harm. And they do have proxies around the world um, Hezbollah and, uh, and uh, uh, the drug trafficking and uh, in Latin America, uh, I believe, and, and this was one of this was the uh, summary of the thesis that I did, was that the Iranians have established um, cells in the Western Hemisphere. Uh, they have a capability to uh, do us great harm. And uh, at this point, they've not, uh, with a couple of exceptions. They've not really activated those cells to any great extent, but I believe the capability is there and we need to be on our guard. Thank you. Any further comments before we wrap up here? Uh, I have great hopes of being asked back again. Um, I think that the American Security Council Foundation is a very important organization um, I think they are doing some great work. I am very proud to be a member of this organization, and uh, I have great hopes to be asked back again at some point in the future. Well, I appreciate your comments on the American Security Council Foundation, and uh, thank you, Colonel, for being with us today on Protecting Our Freedoms podcast. Okay. We would like you to stay tuned for next time when Colonel Prince comes back to address critical race theory in the military. Our podcasts are on our website, YouTube, and Rumble. You can find them by typing in American Security Council Foundation. Would you please consider uh, subscribing to our channel, comment, and share with your family and friends. Please also consider a one-time donation or a membership to the American Security Council Foundation by going on www.ascf.us. 
With your donation or membership of $25 or more, as I mentioned before, you will get a free copy of Mark Levin's American Marxism. And I thank you for joining us today. Please join us again next time as we bring you the story on protecting your freedoms.